As you wait for the class to start, please, um, please take part in the poll TV and uh, the instructions are on the screen. Everyone, thank you for joining us today for this specially curated masterclass, which is part of NUS Open House 2022. We would like to remind you to please set your phone to silent to minimize any disruption. With that, we would like to welcome Dr. Sean Hill, who will be sharing on Rising Asia, asking the question: Is the world class city sustainable? Dr. Thank you very much, Patricia. Um, well. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and thank you very much for giving up 
the Saturday Karmic Business. My name is Sean Teo, and I'm Assistant Professor in the Department of Geography here at the National University of Singapore. Today, I'm joined by my colleague, Dr. Kamalini Rondas, who is Senior Lecturer in the same department. And today, I want to take some time to talk to you about city. But each and every single one of us seated here today, we live in a city, right? and quite an influential and popular one at that, right? But we don't just live in cities, right? We read about cities. For those of you who love reading, I'm sure you've come across at least one of these books, right? Popular books on, on cities that tell us things about cities and urban life and urban government and urban politics, things like that. Right, but more recently as well, of course, you know, we started to consume a lot of media, right, about cities. Okay, not just movies, right? These are three of my favorite movies on cities. If you haven't watched them, okay, I do suggest please go and watch them. But also Netflix, documentaries, and things like that, right? They tell us a lot about cities in different ways. And of course, we also travel to other cities to consume experiences that are quite different from our own here in Singapore. Of course, in the past few years, you know, I'm sure very little traveling has been done, but hopefully, okay, moving forward, we can start to travel more. And some of you here as well, I'm sure in your earlier education, right, you've taken some lessons or modules that have to do with cities in one way or another, right? So what I'm trying to say here, right, is that all of you seated here, okay, now a young adult, you all would have already accumulated some kind of knowledge on cities and what cities represent and what they need to do. And this knowledge can be very personal, okay, but can be very collective as well, in the sense whereby we have some shared understanding of what cities mean. So today's masterclass, I just want you to think about it as a thought experiment, okay? I want to get you to rethink what you think you know about cities, okay, specifically through the lens of a rising Asia. Right? So, in the face of increasing Asian influence around the world, okay, I want you to ask the question how can we rethink what we know about cities and urbanism today, okay, through thinking about Asian cities? Okay, and how this will unfold, of course. I will start to unravel the elements one by one as we move on. All right. Now, when all of you filtered in just now, right, we asked some of you to do an activity, right? Activity was simple. Name the first three global cities that come to mind. Okay, let's have a look at this word cloud here. Right? Very obviously, we, we see Singapore. I mean, that's very obvious. I don't tell you why, because we are Singaporeans, we understand. Okay. But we also see New York and London featuring most prominently in the world cloud here. All right, we see, um, you know, Berlin, right? We see Shanghai, we see Tokyo, right? We see Beijing. Okay, but what is very obvious is that when we talk about global cities, or if I ask you all to name global cities, the very instinctive reaction is to name cities that are from the West. Especially New York, London, right? And, and someone also named Chicago before it was oh, right there at the top, right? So our imagination by and large is quite captured by the fact that you know West is best and you know Asia and the rest of the world are catching up, so to speak. Right? Of course, some of you have named cities like Shanghai, okay, uh, Beijing, of course, because you know recently the ascendancy of China cannot be ignored. And it is precisely the ascendancy of most Asian cities today, not just Chinese cities, that cannot be ignored, that we have the opportunity to study urbanism from a different angle. All right? Let me kind of, you know, corroborate this with another experiment, right? So look at this picture. Okay? You don't have to tell me what city this is, but if you know what city this is, okay, by looking at this picture, Please raise your hand. Yeah, you just gently raise your hand. It's fine. Okay. So I can see, you know, definitely about more than three quarters of you raising your hand, right? And if you would like to travel or 
or work or live in this city for a short term or long term, any period of time, sometime in the future, if you're open to that option, please raise your hand as well. Okay, almost the same number as you know people raising it just now. So what does this tell us, right? This city obviously is, is London, right? Um, you can see Big Ben, okay, Big Ben. You can see Westminster, which is the Parliament House, and of course you can see the iconic Red London buses. But most of us, at one glance, we know what London is, right? And we also have certain interpretations or imagination of London. But right? because we have a lot of knowledge about cities like London and New York City, we can therefore it does you know kind of make us want to go there, live there, study there, work there, whatever, right? So this proves one point. When we think about global cities, right, we equate global cities with modernity. To think about cities like London and New York as you know epitomes of modernity, right, whereby they set a standard for other cities to follow. And coincidentally, a lot of these cities are located in the West. Okay. Now let me move on to the next one. Now, if anyone can know what this city is. Okay, I'll be very impressed. Okay, please impress me. Okay, if anyone knows what this city is, just by looking at this photo, please raise your hand. Okay, not a single one of you, huh? compared to more than three quarters of you just now. Now, the same question I have to ask just to be fair, right? Would anyone want to live in, work in, or go and travel to this city in some time near or far? Okay, even if you don't know what this city is, maybe you're just looking at this picture. Would you want to go? If you want to go, please raise your hand. Okay, one person. Great. Okay, you like the unknown, you like the adventure. Great. But what I'm trying to get to with this, right? I mean, this is Jakarta. Okay, obviously, all of you know what Jakarta is, right? Capital of Indonesia. Right, but from its landscape itself, it, it's not so immediately arrestable that this is Jakarta. Right? And this really proves a point that. When we're thinking about how knowledge is produced about cities, the very famous cities in the West, you know, the so called global cities, right, are given a lot of attention, such that everyone knows what London, what New York is, what it represents. But none of us really know that much about what Jakarta represents, other than the fact that it's the capital of Indonesia. But because we don't know so much about Jakarta, naturally, we wouldn't want to go and travel there or spend time there or get to know the ground better. Right, in particular, if you look at this photo, right? We look at Jakarta in the background as having all these skyscrapers, just like any normal city would, right? But what we also see here in the foreground is this whole hodgepodge of informal settlements, informal buildings that are sometimes built without regulation, right? And therefore, they led to a quite an unruly and messy extent. And that's exactly the problem with urban studies or urban geography today, right? We see Western cities, okay, and put them on a pedestal, okay, and Asian cities such as Jakarta, we call them mega cities or cities that are not global or cities that are, you know, yet to be global or cities that are trying to go global. And as a result, we see all these negative externalities of rapid urbanization, like slums and the like and things like that. Okay? But what is the problem with this, right? What is the problem with this? Okay, please have a look at this graph, okay? And tell me if you can see any specific trend. So this is a graph of average, okay, city GDP growth, right? GDP as in gross domestic product, right? How much the city earns in a given year, okay? From 2016 to 2035. So this is a reflection of real world trends as well as a projection towards the future, okay? Have a look, okay, and, and think about what trends you can identify. Okay, if you don't mind me, young man, since you were so great to say, but could you just maybe just shout out what do you think? Can you identify any trends in the world? Any ideas? Or anyone, you get a shout. No, don't be shy. Go ahead. Go ahead, no worries. Okay, let me show you a clue, right? 
we're thinking about which regions in the world, right, are, are growing rapidly, both in terms of GDP, okay, and in terms of urbanization, because these come hand in hand, right? We look at the bottom of growth, and you can see North America and Europe, okay, they're at the bottom, right? Whereas at the top, you see China, Africa, the Middle East, West of Asia, okay, at the top four here. So what reality tells us is that, you know, the West is no longer growing at the rate that it used to be all those decades ago. Okay, and that if we want to know more about the real world today, it might perhaps be better if we focus on some of the fastest growers and the movers and shakers of the global urban economy, right? So what I want to do is, okay, as geographers and okay, particularly to myself, my research interest, right, is that I would like to propose studying Asian cities on their own terms. Okay, when I say on their own terms, I mean we don't automatically see a city like Jakarta as not yet global. But what we do is we go down Jakarta, right? We look at Jakarta on the ground, okay? We conduct extensive field work in Jakarta, look at some of these interesting things and strategies and developments that happen in Jakarta, and then we make our own interpretation from there, rather than beforehand just saying that, oh, you know, Jakarta is, is you know, not yet global, and many problems in Jakarta are slum and this and that and that kind of thing. Right? So in doing that, then we could possibly have the potential for rethinking contemporary urbanism through urban Asia. So rather than thinking about contemporary urbanism to the West, which most of us up to this point in our lives still do, Okay, and there's nothing wrong with that. Okay, but rethinking contemporary urbanism through Asia or Asian cities is another opportunity that I think we should all explore. Okay. Now, what are the key principles of Asian urbanism? Right. Let me share with you a couple. Okay, number one, we think about this idea and this movement from a global to a world-class city aspiration. Okay, this means that cities like Shanghai, Beijing, even Jakarta, right, they no longer want to be the next London, New York, or Paris, right, per se, in a sense. What they want to do is they want to be even better, or rather, put it more accurately, they want to do something very different. Okay, very different from what London, New York, and Paris have done. Okay, so I would consider this idea okay, to be the world-class city, right? Governments are no longer talking about global city per se, they're talking about world class city now. All right? Number two, the key difference between Asian and Western urbanism is the speed, scale, and extent. Okay? And this leads to various unique forms of development. Okay? The actual material form of development that you see in the city today. Okay, I want to share with you one today called Urban Mega Project. Okay, when we used to think about development in terms of buildings, right, individual buildings and things like that, but governments' development in these days, right, they're not just building individual buildings, they are building entire precincts. Okay, they can fundamentally change the face and the fate of the city. Okay, and of course, as Singaporeans, I'm sure you're familiar with Marina Bay Sands, the entire business improvement district. Okay, the planning is not just building for building, it's everything, it's holistic. Okay, and this is one of the more unique forms of Asian urbanism that we are seeing. But mega projects are not just mega projects, right? They are specifically packaged and marketed in certain ways. Okay, one of the most popular strategies and discourses that you hear today is sustainable development. I'm sure all of you see there have a lot of this term. Okay, but really, what does this term actually entail? Okay, I'm going to tell you a little bit more about it. Okay, today. Right, and in thinking about Asian urbanism, right, and these unique new forms like other mega projects, you know, couched in the idea of sustainable development. Okay, I think we also owe it to ourselves to ask what are the affordances and limitations of these things? Okay, meaning we need to think about inequality that I mentioned. Because we know that urbanism is deeply unequal. 
We're all very privileged, right? I mean, I would, I would expect most of us to be very privileged, okay? But we also need to think about how our actions, how the actions of governments affect those who are possibly less privileged. Okay, urbanization creates winners and losers. All right? But we also need to think about the opportunities. Okay, so it's not just about criticizing, criticizing, criticizing. It's about thinking about opportunities, okay, for a better urban life. Okay, not just for the most marginalized, but for everyone in general as well. Okay, so these are the messages of an Asian urbanism that I'm trying to present to you today. Okay, and I'm gonna, of course, as the geographers, I'm gonna give you a real life case study but to kind of concretize some of my arguments that I just made. Okay, I'm gonna bring you a mega project, okay, from Tianjin in China. Some of you may have thought of Tianjin, but I'm very sure not many of us really know that much of Tianjin. And this is exactly what I'm trying to say. Right? Rather than just discounting Tianjin as uh, you know, just another city that's catching up, we could potentially see cities like Tianjin, okay, as leaders, right? Leaders in development of some of the most unique urban experiments in the world today. Okay, and the Tianjin Eco City, which I will be talking about, was basically an entire city built from scratch. So this is what it looks like, okay, or what it looks like rather before they built it. Okay, just marshland, soft land, okay? And this, oh, okay, I apologize. Apparently the, the animation is not working, but don't worry. There will be pictures of the completed Tianjin Eco City later, okay? But let me go through some of the key elements of the So just take some time, okay, just take 30 seconds to quickly read through uh, some of this stuff. Okay? And this, these are excerpts, okay, from, uh, Minister Lawrence Wong's opening address at the opening ceremony of it. Okay, if you're wondering why Minister Lawrence Wong was there, okay, it's because the Tianjin Eco City is a joint project between Singapore and the Tianjin government. Okay, and Minister Lawrence Wong said that, you know, when we think about the Tianjin Eco City, we want to think about the environment, the economy, and people together. Okay, what this means, right, is that sustainable development is not just an environmental concern. Okay, a lot of people think, okay, mistakenly that sustainable development is just about the environment. It's not. It's about harmonizing the environment, the economy, and the social, which is the people, right, social. Okay, so how does that play out in practice, right, materially? That's number one. And number two, what Tianjin is trying to do is, is relevant for the rest of the world because it is not just a one-off project. As you see here from the second excerpt here, right, China's aspiration is to develop a model of sustainable development by using Tianjin as a pilot project. Okay, and the ambition really is to disseminate this model to as much of the world as possible. So we can see the Tianjin Eco City as a very good case study to help us understand what governments are trying to do to push the frontier of sustainable development and the world class city as well. Okay. Now, there, there you are. Okay. So now you can see this is what Tianjin looks like today. Okay, I want to share with you a little bit okay, of, of some of the key elements of Tianjin. Okay, number one, it, it costs about US 10 billion to build so far. Okay, so far it's still ongoing. Okay. Number two, it is three times the size of Zengkang. Okay, so I mean, I mean, you know, not too big, but not too small either, right? Certainly not a small project. Okay. It aims to house 350,000 residents. Okay, but it's not there yet. Okay, it's getting there. And the most unique thing about this city is that it's built on certain eco. KPI, right? So you can see on the screen, I'm not going to read out for you, but you can have a read, right? So the government's objective is to build these buildings with these kinds of eco elements in mind, all right? So I've told you a little bit about the Eco City, right? I've told you a little bit about it, so you, you probably have a little bit of an understanding of what it is. But what I want to do today, right, is as I'm a geographer, okay, and as geographers, we like to go down to the ground, as I mentioned, to really do deep kind of studies to understand what's happening. 
so that you can critically interrogate what we know about this so called ecosystem. Right? So, what I'm going to do is I'm going to show you a couple of photos, and these photos were all taken by researchers that went to KCC. Okay, to have a look and take photos and things like that. And I'm going to offer you a set of problematizations of questions to think about. Okay, so number one, this is a typical kind of gated community neighborhood in the ecosystem, right? Sort of like a condominium kind of thing. This researcher found that, you know, you see um, this wind, wind turbine, this solar powered uh, lamppost, and so this wind turbine as well. So, like I mentioned, it's not eco technology, right? But what the, the funny thing is that this researcher found out, right, that the residents told him that these things don't work at all. Okay? So, I don't know whether the government turned it off temporarily or whether they're literally just there to show. But residents have been living there for one or two years, they said they've never seen this wind turbine. Even the student. Okay? So this begs the question, right? Is the eco city about aesthetics? As you can see here, right? A really nice kind of garden by garden aesthetics. Okay, this is just one picture. Entire eco city is about the trees, you know, stuff like that, you know, green sculptures, things like that. But is the eco city about aesthetics only? Okay, or is it about you know really benefiting? Okay. Next photo. This is a community recycling receptacle, right? So residents who live in these neighborhoods, the people say they, they need to recycle, they need to come down, sort out the recyclables and stuff like that. Okay. This researcher found that literally nobody uses this thing, right? Like literally nobody. Okay, and this really, I mean, if you watch Korean drama, I'm sure a lot of you watch Korean drama today, right? I'm sure you've seen scenes where, where, where the character takes that recycling really seriously. Right, in Japan as well, you know, Japanese they take their recycling really seriously. But the Chinese, as well as you know, us Singaporeans, we don't take our recycling seriously. Okay, so this begs the question, right? Is it enough to say that it's sustainable development if you plan some kind of city, right? This mega project, or does sustainable development have to come from within us? Right? Do we have to rethink our relationship with nature, right, for a chance for sustainable development to be materialized? Okay, this is an important question. It is also important to think about how the eco city is being built. Right? The eco city promises to be a sustainable development, but this photo right, shows that there are many, many you know, in industries, small industries located, located in and around the eco city, and these industries provide materials and resources such as concrete, okay, as you see here. And this researcher found that you know, the practices of construction are extremely unsustainable, right? They, they, they fall way into the ground, into the rivers, and all that kind of stuff. Right? So, isn't it ironic that the so called eco city is built upon unsustainable practices? So, we need to ask ourselves, right? When we think about sustainable development, are we thinking about it just in terms of the space of the eco city itself? Or do we have to think about sustainable development in wider terms, okay, in terms of the entire Tianjin city or even the entire nation of China, for example? Okay, and not to forget, who builds these eco cities? Okay, thousands of migrants that come from here and far in China. These migrants will never get a chance to stay in these eco cities. This is not just a financial consideration. In China, there's a household registration system. And because these migrants are not registered in Tianjin, they will never be able to afford or even qualify for public housing. So the question is this, right? The eco city is supposed to be socially sustainable, but people who build these cities do they even get a chance to enjoy these cities? And this question is extremely relevant for Singapore as well. I'm sure you all know what I'm talking about, right? Our city is literally built by thousands and thousands of migrant workers. And do they get to enjoy the city? I don't know. I'll leave it as an open question. Okay, so that's why I talked to you about the environmental and social contradiction of the ecosystem. And there are economic contradictions as well, right? Lots of people, when Tianjin was just starting to get built, people criticized Tianjin ecosystem as a gross city. And I'm sure you know you all know that China is home to thousands of thousands of like maybe dozens or even hundreds of gross cities. So people actually criticized the Chinese government's way of you know development, saying that ah, you know, they just build these giant cities and then hope that people come. But nobody comes, right? Because while they were building a lot of residential stuff, they were not building the critical infrastructure like schools and transport, things like that. So therefore, a lot of these, you know, buildings were left empty. 
Okay. So I've given you some questions to think about, right? Not to take the eco city for granted, or not to take sustainability or world class for granted, but to ask important questions. And it is through thinking about these questions and finding your answers to them, right? Then you will improve your learning process. But geography or critical geography is not just about critiquing, right? It's not just about saying, ah, the government is bad, this, that, blah, 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 right? It's not. Like I said, it's also about thinking more pragmatically and finding solutions. So can we think about the eco city as a longer term project rather than just a one off kind of thing? Right? So this is a press release from Enterprise Singapore, okay, which shows that Singapore and Tianjin just recently renewed their commitment to continue constructing the eco city. Okay, so this is a long term project, okay, it's by no means done, okay, it's halfway there. Okay, but what we can see today from their website, okay, you can see here that now there's about 100,000 people living there, and you can read here, okay, all the amenities are now going up bit by bit, and most importantly, right, the Trans City Railway has been built, connecting people from Tianjin to other cities, because a lot of people commute, right, to work and live there. So if you start to think about the Eco City as a progressive project, okay, a longer term one, Okay, not just as a one-off, then you can potentially start to see the relevance and the potential of this kind of model of sustainable development and world-class development. But this is not to say that it doesn't come with its limitations as well. So as critical geographers, we try to balance okay, the critiques and the affordances, okay, to formulate okay, a more nuanced argumentation. Okay, so never Okay, we, we seldom always go them to one polemical side. We seldom always say this is definitely this or this is definitely that. Because we know that you know there is always a gray area. All right. So we can see perhaps you know Kenny Eco City now today as residents really having the opportunity to perhaps renew their relationship with nature. And as I mentioned just now, I personally think that our relationship with nature is really, really important if sustainable development is actually going to be. Okay, so this is something for y'all to think about again. Now, what can we learn from Kenji University, right? The story that is going to right? What are some of the summaries of what we can learn? Okay, and in these summaries, right, okay, coincidentally, okay, these are some of the really important themes that our department specializes in as well. Okay, so you can look forward to that if you do come to our department. Number one. World class cities and sustainable development are categories that have to be guaranteed. Okay, they shouldn't be categories that you take for granted. Okay, you should literally start asking what exactly is a world class city? What exactly is sustainable development? Okay, and then you move on from there. Okay, you shouldn't just take what you read, okay, as the gospel truth. Okay, and in interrogating these categories, number one, okay, please think about the integration. Of economy, environment, and society, right? Like I said, okay, it's not just about the environment, it's about integration and harmony. Okay, number two, as I've already mentioned, things safely because I personally really believe in this. We might need to think about nature society relationships as well. But we live among nature, and in Singapore, especially, right? The government has recently done a city in nature. What does that really mean, right? Are we really having a very strong symbiotic relationship with nature? Right, all of this aesthetic, like I just said. Okay. Number three, you think about the geologies of migration. I give you an example just now of these, you know, construction workers coming, building the city, but not being able to access it. Okay. And we have a very strong migration cluster here in our department as well. Okay. So I think that it's important to study migration, right? Not just at the top end, expatriates, but also at the bottom end as well. Okay, and finally, of course, last but definitely not least, right, the Eco City presents us opportunities to study environmental technologies and the technical side, the scientific side, okay, about eco development, sustainable development, things like that. And that's the beauty of the geography department, because not only do we have a social science arm, human geography, we also have an earth science arm, physical geography. And even more beautiful, right, our Researchers are professors, right? What we do is we often have conversations across the subject of this. Okay, these are not easy conversations because it's really hard to marry science with social science. But these are productive conversations nevertheless. Right, so if you're interested in, you know, kind of the earth sciences as well, like hydrology, urban climate, right, mangroves, for example, 
So these are all things you can look forward to as well, and more precisely, you can actually do the integration. But you can think of geography as a kind of small CHS within CHS. Okay, but if you don't want to integrate, you want to focus largely on human geography or physical geography, you can as well. Okay, we are flexible that way. And most importantly, right, we, we talk about Asian cities, talk about Western cities, right, but we do not forget Singapore as well. And a lot of our you know, faculty members, we have a vested interest in Singapore as well. So I think it's really important to have the opportunity to come to, come to any other geography and also think about how you can rethink Singapore. Okay, maybe not the global city, but a city that is trying different ways to become world class, for example. Okay, so I'm just going to end, it, end this off here, right? If there's only one thing that you are taking away from today's masterclass, is how can you rethink what it means to be a modern city? Okay, is a modern city the so called global city that we talk about? Or can we even take cities like Jakarta? This is a picture of Jakarta, by the way, right? It looks very different, right? So you know that representation is very important. Okay, but I would like you to go home, okay, today and for the rest of your life, even right, try to rethink and question what you know about. All right, with that in mind, thank you very much for your time. Okay, if you have any questions, please ask us. My colleague, Kamal, and myself we will be happy to address them. Thank you. So we'd like to invite you to ask any questions you may have. Um, please keep them concentrated their mic at the other side of the aisle. And um, those of you who are on Zoom, please feel free to post your questions via the um, the Q and A or the chat function. Thank you. Any questions? You can also shout it out from where you're sitting. Yeah, please go ahead. Okay, before before I answer the question, can I just trouble you to maybe define a little bit what you mean by geographical investigation in, in your own words? Just one second. Yeah. Uh, there will be many, many opportunities. Okay, we have a module that specifically teaches okay, these kind of uh, methodologies, like both quantitative and qualitative. Okay, but the thing about our geography module is well, a lot of our assignments uh, sometimes require you to go and do field work. Okay, obviously, you know, realistically, we let you go to certain places in Singapore, or you know, I mean, even with, I mean, before COVID, obviously, we had the opportunity to even travel to Malaysia, for example, but now not so much, right? Okay, so there will be a lot of opportunities for you to do very hands on learning. Because ultimately, that's what geology is the study of space. And we can study space in very abstract terms, like what I've talked to you about, right? What is global, what is world class. But at the end of the day, we also have the opportunity to study space on a very, very concrete level. Yeah, come on, we try to add to that, please. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, hi, everyone. Uh, so I think the question here is around uh, the school for the field work, right? Um, so I think, yeah, we have been affected by COVID, right? But um, I think the, the kind of like undergraduate fieldwork opportunities definitely exist. So any module that you take, right, uh, usually there's a component where you can sort of develop your own research question, right? A small project that's tied to your assignment. But as you, as you sort of progress along in your fourth year, right, you have a final year project on honours thesis, there are lots of opportunities to also do research tied to professors' projects, what we call um, ROPs, undergraduate research opportunities. Right, so professors actually have these kinds of projects where you can work with them, and that counts as part of your module. So, your question is Is there a way for me to explore questions, my own questions? Right, yes, definitely. Right, and the way we craft our assignments in geography and, and other departments as well is that we try to keep those broad so they, they speak to the tenets of, say, concepts like sustainable development or urbanization. But the, the particular question that you might want to ask. There's hope for you to frame that yourself, right? And take that as a project. And it's possible to do that without going on field trips. It means looking at data sets that already exist, doing secondary sort of research. But for your final year project where you have a little bit more time, right? So in the past, we've had students go and actually conduct their own research where they collect their own primary data. Yeah. Thank you. Um, 
with a bachelor degree or are there like or like is it like better career option like should I like go and like get a master's or PhD like specialize in something? Yeah, I mean, thanks for asking this question because frankly, I can give a whole talk about this question. Right? But I'll try to be very concise. Okay, um, first and foremost, right, I, I want you all to rethink what we know about geography as well. Okay, there are three C's content, competency, and character. Okay, for most of us, I mean, I'm Singaporean too, right? I'm through the education system. Okay, so for most of us, we, we know that our primary, secondary education is very much focused on content. It's about you know memorizing stuff and trying to apply them. Sure, fair enough, right? And so most of you might come in to FASS, for example, and think that okay, my major in geography, I am stuck to a certain model of content, which means I can only work in certain jobs. I want you all to dispel that thinking today, okay? Because I can say with confidence, okay, that if you take a social science, okay, especially the social science, so geography included, all right, what you are building. Is competency and character. So geography is a lens. It's not just a bag of content where you, you know you, you read stuff, but it's a way of training you to see the world and to see people in a certain way. Think about it as wearing a particular kind of sunglasses or whatever, right? So at our department, right, our teaching is oriented towards that. It's not just about okay today, just all the content go and memorize the exam go home. It's about really challenging you to change your beliefs, to change the way you write, the way you speak, the way you think. Okay, and to answer your question directly, then, okay, the career opportunities, frankly, if you ask me, are actually potentially endless. Of course, if you want to take geography and you tell me you want to become a doctor, then I mean, you have to certain, you know what, certain disciplines, you have to take content specific ones, like architecture and things like that. But I'll give you personal experience, right? I worked three years. In the luxury marketing and sports industry before I became a professor, before I went to my PhD, master's, and became a professor. I was a geography major, right? But I went to the private sector and I, I did very well. Okay, so you don't just have to go to URA, HDB, and SLA and all these things. Of course, you can. Our geography graduates have a really strong presence in these networks. And if you are very interested in urban planning, you are very interested in housing, of course you can, right? And geography allows you to do that. Okay, and I'll just say, say very, very briefly about PhD and master's before I pass on to my colleagues because I'm sure there's a lot to say as well. Okay, I think that you know you should go through your undergraduate studies first. Okay, take the opportunity to really enjoy yourself, to learn and change yourself as a person. Okay, focus on the study, sure, but focus on making friends and things like that. Okay, when it comes to postgraduate studies, take your time to think about. When you are in your fourth year, then you will have a much better idea. Because trust me, your representation of your imagination of graduate studies right now, right, trust me, is very different to what you will feel when you are in your fourth year. Okay, so that's number one. So take your time, don't rush. Okay. Number two, will um, graduate studies help me in my employment prospects? Okay, I will say that if you have a PhD in Singapore, the prospects are not as wide as in other countries, whereby a lot of companies are more open to doing uh, taking PhDs. In Singapore, if you ask me if you want to work in the public or private sector, right? Okay, a master's is, is, is usually good enough. My personal opinion. Okay, other people might think differently. Okay, so think long and hard before you go into a PhD because it's a, it's a, it's a long journey, it's a tough journey as well. Okay, but long story short, okay, don't think that geography can only give you these two jobs. It's trust me, potentially endless. Okay, and I'm a living example of that. Right. Um, so just to add on uh, one thing here, right? So you know, earlier on Sean mentioned this thing about um, geography as a new CHF, right? So I think this is um, this notion of intradisciplinarity, intradisciplinarity, right? disciplinarity, right? So what we're talking about here is that if you take a geography, uh, if you major in geography, right? Uh, in the first year, you will do like this gateway module, which is a one one o one kind of like entry module, right? In your second year, you have to take Exposure that means physical geography, geographical in a uh, geographic information system or GIS. Then you will learn methods, and then you will do like uh, political and economic geography and social and cultural geography. So by the second year, you would have actually become in a way a very integrated geographer, right? So why is this important? Uh? When you go out to work, uh, you need to be able to integrate this kind of what geographers call spatiality, right? And understanding of social relations and space. 
It talks about nature and the physical environment alongside human beings, right? So it's the, we're one of those disciplines where materiality, right? It means like things like wind turbines, benches, roads, right? And physical spaces, mountains, volcanoes, rivers, right? You look at that, that image of London, the river Thames is running right through that, okay? That type of geography. And you saw the image about people hanging off buildings, right? We have the discipline that brings all of that together. So when you go out for a cocktail, right, for your first job, right, and you get asked that question and you're thinking, oh my God, what am I going to answer this as the CEO of some company? I can promise you, and I'm not just saying this because I'm a geographer, that the geography degree will help you to answer whatever that question is. Okay? And I can tell you this because that was my experience, right? So my first job out of geography was with a consulting company, right? And it was the, part of the economy school, right? So I was there in a cocktail reception, people asking me about these kinds of things, but geography actually helped me to think about the world I lived in in a very particular kind of way. And so this is what makes our discipline really unique, right? It brings that physical, the material, and the human aspect together. Okay? And that's really, really important, right? So that's my like pitch for geography, all right? So yeah, so we'll take the next question. Yeah, but sorry, just to add on to Kamal, right? But I just want to remind you again, because I mean, Kamal was talking about the benefits of integration perspective. But for, for some of us, like myself, okay, I'm, I'm ashamed to say that I'm not a very good physical geographer at all. Right? I'm a very much a human geographer. So for some of us who, who just want to specialize in human geography or physical geography, it's still possible. Okay, so I just want to re emphasize this point. Okay, it's flexible. You can either be an integrationist or you can be a specialist within geography. That's fine. Yep, at the back. Uh, sorry, are there any differences between the uh, geography major uh, right here in FASS and as opposed to the geography major in your College at Public Money? Okay, so I think um, one thing you have to, to remember is that NUS College, right, in a way it's a, it's a liberal arts college, right, so you will get specialists, right, who are talking about issues, so maybe they might be talking about urban studies, they might be talking about inequality, and maybe a geographical, uh, there might be a geographer in that college, right, but it's not the same as an entire faculty, a department that does a more holistic kind of geographical approach, right? So if you go to any liberal arts college, right, you will have basically people from different disciplines sitting together asking questions, right? EHS is kind of unique in the sense that it takes a little bit of both, right? They ask those kinds of questions, but at the same time, what you are doing is you're becoming, maybe you're, you're, you're majoring in geography and you're majoring in economics, and you ask those questions in that way, right? rather than just taking a, a broad-based approach or a liberal arts approach, right? So my answer to your question is that there will be a difference, right? Because if you if you major in geography and you're doing 15 modules in geography, right? At some level, even if you are doing maybe a handful of those are physical geography, number one, you would have to do, you cannot escape the physical geography. You'll have to do at least one, right? So the way we set up our program in geography is that you will come out with an understanding of geography as a discipline. And there is a particular evolution of the discipline that you must understand to call yourself a geography major. So to me, that is quintessentially a different thing. So if you want to really understand geography, you have to come to us and worry that's my yeah. That's my saying. It's so cool that you have enjoyed the class. Thank you once again, Dr. Leo, Dr. Kamal. Uh, we have come to the end of the session. And if you have pre-registered for the walking tour, please head out to the tour booth outside LT11 to begin your tour. Due to safe management measures, we have limited capacity for this course and only accept pre sign up. However, feel free to take a walk around the campus or take a shuttle bus to U Town and take part in the other activities throughout the day. And thank you. We hope you have a great day in the US. Thank you very much. Thank you.